Hi, Roy here on my channel, Roy Reads Anything, including assorted books that I'm now going to tell you about in a recent reads segment. Uh, so just catching up with some, some books I've read over the past sort of few weeks. Um, it's now the beginning of October. Last month was obviously September and it was Cimmerian September when a bunch of us read books about Conan the Barbarian um, and we were reading the original stories by Robert E. Howard and in the dying hours of that month I spotted on the mojo wire that there had been a new Conan pastiche story published um, and the sort of synchronicity of a new sequel by another hand appearing you know, during that very month made me think, oh, maybe maybe squeeze that in as a read because it was a short story. So basically, Titan Books are bringing out, uh, I believe monthly, a short story about either Conan or one of the other Robert E. Howard characters and they're written by a whole bunch of authors. And the first of these has appeared for $1.99. Uh, that being... Conan, Lord of the Mount. Lord of the Mount by Stephen Graham Jones. So I gambled my 199, downloaded that story and read it. It's had mixed reception and I would kind of add to that, I suppose, you know, on the plus side, I like the idea of regular short stories. Um, seems to be true to the sort of pulpy spirit of the whole original endeavour. Um, this particular story, it's it's action packed. It's headlong. It's got bloody fights and a cool monster. Um, I for me, it didn't ring particularly true as Conan the character. Now reading it immediately after reading hundreds of pages of Robert E. Howard is probably like the worst way to read it in terms of um, comparing it with the, with the source material. Um, you know, there was, there's stuff about the language, about the way the magic worked, about Conan's character. Just didn't do it for me. So um, I'd probably notch it up as a sort of two and a half to three star read interesting idea i might read others i might wait for reviews before i press the button for my 199 but it's there you know an example of the uh, the conan flame being kept alive uh, so that was one thing uh, also on kindle i read in ollie's patreon group the whistling by rebecca netley uh, so the whistling very different it's an atmospheric ghost story a woman who is a governess goes to uh, a big house on a on a remote island um, interesting how governesses are a sort of staple of fiction I suppose they have sort of mobility you know they have a reason to turn up into a, a situation and um, they've got a little more flexibility in their working day than say a housemaid would um, anyway yes so it's a uh, there's weird stuff going on in this family. There's a child that's been rendered speechless by bad things that have happened. And it's very creepy. And certainly in the first half, as it was, things were getting established, I actually found it quite frightening. And I would only read it during daylight. Um, it, it's good. I'd say it's not, for me, not as, as good as, for instance, Dark Matter by Michelle Paver or pavers other adult books um but pretty good and um just i think it kind of outlasted its own concepts a little bit and by the end it was it stopped being frightening it was just like oh how's it going to be resolved who's who did what and to whom and why um but yeah good i i liked it um and then I didn't set out to do Shorty September, but I have accidentally done one of the prompts because I was in a bookshop and I picked up Termush by Sven Holm, um, which is a sort of 100 page long uh, speculative fiction novella. Um, and I just got it because the blurb was interesting. 
I thought it looked nice. Now, you know, I don't generally enjoy the tendency towards semi-abstract covers. Um, but this, this one's actually quite nice. So I thought, well, nice book, interesting. So bought it. So basically it's a, it's a post-apocalyptic story. The first person narrator is one of a group of, of rich people who have paid to live in a hotel that has all the sort of bunkers and food supplies and clean water supply, etc. beneath it. So they had, you know, it's all, all prepared. And then when when bad things began to happen, they've moved into this hotel and now they're li things are calmed down a bit and they're living in the hotel part in a kind of quite you know, not unpleasant and but obviously restricted life. Um, now and again, they have to go down into the shelters because of, um, you know, there's, the radiation levels are a bit high. Um, very sort of subtle and I was going to say muted is sort of, um, you know, it's not a dramatic post-apocalyptic thing. Um, I thought while I was reading it, because I deliberately just plunged into it, I didn't read the intro by Jeff Vandermeer or anything. I thought, oh, this is a good, um, good analogy for the pandemic. You know, sort of people trapped in a situation that not, not too bad, like lockdown, but on the other hand, it's terrible and frightening. Uh, but it turns out it's written in 1967, so obviously not a pandemic novel, um, although we can read it as such now. Um, I read this on the day after I'd had a, a, a COVID shot, actually, so I was feeling fairly dreadful. So good time to be reading about characters getting radiation sickness. <laughs> um, and it is... You know, got me thinking about how I've always lived with this sort of stuff, being in the sort of post-atomic, born into the atomic era. My bones have the strontium-90 in them. Um, you know, the I, the 80s, I, there, there was sort of atomic panic then, but I even remember as a tiny child, although I didn't understand the news or what people were talking about, I can remember having a dream that showed that I had somehow absorbed the sort of um, the idea of the atomic, you know, a danger from potential atomic destruction. And at the same time, there was like the supposed, you know, Stingray on the television was an atomic powered submarine and it's part of the sort of technological advances. Anyway, so it's it's a post apocalyptic it's it's I'd say it's a speculative lit fic piece, really. It's about how people, you know, it's like things have happened, not as spectacularly as anybody expected, but it's all happened and it's like everything's different. But how different is it? Is it going to be so different that like air will be different than it was before? Things like that. So the alienation and the estrangement are very high. Um, it's a subtle piece that I'll probably read again to get the most out of it. If it reminded me of anything, it reminded me a bit of J.G. Ballard, um, where, you know, Ballard would put people into extreme situations and on some level they're living in a sort of normal way within the world of this sort of extreme stuff happening, like when he has people um, going feral within a high-rise block, for instance. And a similar sort of almost sometimes affectless kind of way, flat way of talking about the, the things that are happening. Um, so, and yes, it's um, Sven Holm. Um, it's, he is a Danish author. If I've got that wrong, I will put a caption up now to s and put a dumps cap on my head. Yes, translated from the Danish. So it does meet one of the... Sh um, Shorty September prompts, the Lederhosen prompt for, <laughs> uh, for a translated work. So that's another thing I read. Good, I'd probably give this a sort of four starers. And um, yeah, recent reads. Back soon with something else. Did you want to say something about chainmail bikinis or will you save that for when I I'll talk about Red Sonia? Sonia. Uh, yes, okay. <laughs> When I'm wearing By one. the way, what I do want to say is, do Danes wear lederhosen? No, no, it's not a. The, the prompt was. The prompts were all different forms of shorts. Oh, I see. Uh, ah, 
to tie in with the kind of yeah so it's just a Yes, 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 yes. Ah, yes, oh, the whimsy. Not the hitherto unsuspected Danish lederhosen. <laughs> um, I'd pay good money to see that, sir. Okay, finishing now. <laughs>